Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, thank you to everyone who's joining us on Zoom and on Facebook. We are very proud to present um, one of our webinars that is a part of the Four Corners Lecture Series. Uh, we have um, our presenters coming up here from on Bearsers National Monument. Before we go ahead and introduce our presenters, um, I want to begin as we begin all of our webinars with our land acknowledgement that the Crow Canyon Archaeological Center acknowledges the Pueblo, Ute, Paiute, Diné, and Hickory Apache people on whose traditional homelands our institution sits, where our campus is, and upon which we work and reside. Our mission-related work would not be possible without Indigenous people in the past, present, and future, and we respectfully recognize and honor ancestral and descendant Indigenous communities for their contributions to all humankind. We are grateful to all Indigenous people, and Crow Canyon supports the preservation and protection of cultural traditions, ancestral connections, and sacred lands. This is integral to our mission to empower present and future generations by making the human past accessible and relevant through archaeological research, experiential education, and American Indian knowledge. Um, you can check us out at our website at www.crowcanyon.org. Um, I also want to thank all of you who have registered today through Zoom and, and so generously donated to this webinar and to our webinar series. We are entirely run on donations. Um, we are so grateful to our loyal audience and to all of uh, the new folks that join us uh, every week. So thank you and uh, please continue to support us. Uh, if you need a couple of Zoom instructions, um, our presenters are going to be showing a PowerPoint uh, about their work. So you can grab the black bar uh, next to our heads and move us over to the right if we're taking up too much of the PowerPoint presentation. Um, please, when you do have questions throughout the presentation, could you enter them into the Q&A uh, rather than in, in the chat? We will check the chat, but it's a lot easier for us to make sure we get your questions answered if you enter them into the Q&A. We are live streaming on Facebook if you have trouble with your Zoom, and this talk and others will be available on our YouTube channel. Uh, in the next couple of weeks, we have some more incredible speakers coming up. We have Dr. John Ive with Holes in Our Moccasins, Holes in Our Stories, Apache and Origins, and the Promontory Caves. Very much looking forward to hearing uh, about that work. And our own uh, Dr. Jonathan Dombrowski, who is doing his postdoctoral research here at Crow Canyon and is my neighbor just across the driveway here, uh, will be talking about ancestral Pueblo fishing strategies. So please join us to see Jonathan talk about his work as well. Uh, so without further ado, I would like to uh, introduce our presenters, Jared Lundell and Whitney Peterson. Jared Lundell is uh, currently an archaeologist at Bearsers National Monument and the BLM Monticello Field Office. Uh, he is working on developing education and outreach for the public. He is particularly interested in educating visitors about uh, proper etiquette at cultural resource sites and has his master's degree from Northern Arizona University. Uh, his partner here, Whitney Peterson, is a program manager at SciArc, a fantastic nonprofit uh, in the Bay Area that Crow Canyon has worked with before. Um, she is leading digital documentation projects um, that result in interpretation and storytelling. Her master's is from the University of, of Denver, and she studies the role of material culture in community and public understanding of historical knowledge. Uh, before this position, she was with the National Park Service. So welcome, uh, Jared and Whitney. We are so excited uh, for, for your talk. Uh, we are very interested in Bearsers National Monument here at Crow Canyon, and I know many of our stakeholders are as well. So with that, I will stop the share and turn it over to you all. Thanks, Liz. Um, it's great to be here, and thank you guys for having us for the Four Corners Lecture Series. Um, so today we're going to talk about some digital documentation and virtual guided tours that um, SciArc has helped us with here at Bears Ears National Monument. Um, we talk about a couple of sites. Um, they worked at with us at House on Fire and the Mule Canyon Village site, which some of you may be familiar with. Um, they're just off of Highway 95, one is an old, I shouldn't say old, it's a restored pub, asset, ancestral Pueblo in site, um, actually restored as part of the work done on Highway 95 in the late 70s. And then also um, some interpretation and some sidewalks were built around it in the 80s by the BLM as part of 
um, preparing the site for the public, as well as House on Fire, which has become one of the most popular sites in Bears Ears National Monument um, for visitation and gets quite a lot of visitation. Um, so these two sites we chose because they're hardened for regular visitation um, and also because they're getting a lot of visitation already. And we really needed help to reach broad audiences um, uh, about these two sites and help help the public better understand etiquette at these sites, as well as at Cross Bears Ears National Monument. Um, so kind of the big things we're trying to do here are um, education and outreach. Um, at Bears Ears National Monument, as I'm sure most of you are Experience. So um, we're definitely trying to help reach out to those new visitors um, and also increase um, their understanding of Bears Ears National Monument and the resources they might be seeing out here um, and interacting with. So this, these, this work with SIRC helps us reach a pretty broad audience. Um, I think since we put these videos, the guided tours online, I think we've had about 9,000 um, visits to the website. Um, so we're hoping that this kind of helps reach a broad audience and helps them better understand etiquette here at Bears Ears National Monument and honestly across the Four Corners region. So that's one of our main goals here. Um, this also kind of helps increase public access to public lands for folks who may not be able to um, visit Bears Ears National Monument um, and lets them kind of see the importance of this area. Um, especially to local native groups um, and tribes, our sovereign nations in the region. Um, so kind of the big things we're focused on here with this is archaeological site uh, etiquette, um, as well as interpretation. Um, so this first set um, we actually did with our staff internally, and Whitney will talk a little bit about our interpretation process for this. But um, Shirley Cloud Lane, our Native American coordinator, actually did all the interpretation for for this actual guided tour. Um, the long term, we hope to get more descendant community connection involvement into these projects. Um, and we'll talk about that at the end of the presentation as well. So with the work that SIARC is helping us with now. <laughs> so next slide, Whitney. I think it's all of you. Thank you, Jared. And thank you, Crow Canyon, for hosting today. And thank you all for being here. Excited to share more about this project. Um, so as mentioned, this is a collaboration between um, BLM at Bears Ears National Monument and SIARC. So I wanted just to provide a little bit of background on SIARC and our organization and the work that we do. So we're a nonprofit organization based in the Bay Area. We've been around for almost 20 years now. So since we began documenting cultural heritage sites, in 2003, we've documented over 200 sites in 40 countries around the world. And so while our work at SIARC began very focused on the documentation of built heritage, um, over the last decade, our work has also expanded to utilize this documentation, not only to provide opportunities for people to connect with that tangible cultural heritage, but also with the people and their stories and histories that are so integral to making these places significant today. So through our documentation, we're also looking to amplify these places and their diverse stories and hopefully inspire reflection and dialogue about history and heritage in general. And so we do our work through a number of different mediums or outputs. The virtual tours that we're talking about today are both accessible uh, online through the web, as well as like your mobile device or cell phone. We've also done other projects that are, um, that you can access through the virtual reality medium as well. So our approach at SIARC has evolved through thinking about cultural heritage sites really as, as place-based work. So doing this digital documentation, not only of these structures, but of these places. So looking at these sites as places that encompass people and histories, stories, ecosystems, and these broader landscapes and other aspects that make a place what it is. 
So through that place-based perspective and approach, our hope is that we can create more equitable and respectful access to heritage through documenting places, maybe that historically wouldn't have been documented, but also amplifying you know, perspectives and voices through that documentation and uh, education process. So for each of our projects, we are always involved in this ongoing consultation with our partners um, to identify any sensitivities related to the heritage sites that we work with and then best provide this meaningful educational opportunities for people to engage with these places. So as part of that work with our partners, we combine both this interpretive process as well as our documentation process to guide our work in kind of meaningfully bringing together both that tangible documentation, but also the narrative component of these histories. So for our interpretive process, we work with our partners and stakeholders basically to create a scaffolding for, for the stories and narrative that's presented through the virtual experience. Um, so that includes identifying you know, the key messages that we want to communicate to audiences or this overarching theme or big idea that uh, holds everything together that you experience in these virtual tours. And then of course we have our documentation process as well where we work with our partners and stakeholders to identify the specific areas or structures uh, that we want to focus our documentation work on and then uh, internally work on you know, creating a capture plan for how we're going to capture that digitally and um, publish that for a virtual audience. So for this specific project, when we uh, focus in the documentation on the Mule Canyon Village and House on Fire, like Jared mentioned, we worked um, closely with the BLM staff to explore these different interpretive opportunities and develop kind of an interpretive framework for that. Um, so for this project, we did that through conducting interviews with different staff members at BLM to understand the significance and history of both of these places. And from that, we're, we created kind of a, a thematic approach for the virtual tour experiences that you can engage with, as well as um, a draft and outline of that, that virtual experience. So through that process, um, we identified this main big idea or theme. And so we, we didn't only want to focus on the significance of this place historically, but something that was also really important about this is to communicate to audiences that this site really lives and breathes in its ongoing connection to descendant communities today. So we wanted to emphasize both the, the past and present uh, significant of these places. And through that also emphasize respectful ways that people can engage with these places, both virtually uh, and in person. So um, from, from those interviews and conversations, we identified this, this main theme that we call a big idea that in the past, uh, and today, the Bears Ears landscape has been essential to communities' uh, survival and resilience. And so through recording those interviews, we selected uh, the narrator, Shirley Cloud Lane, who's the BLM Native American coordinator. And so through that virtual experience, you can hear about the significance of both of these places or sites um, and histories connected to this area through, through Shirley herself. And, I'll give a little demo and preview of the experience here um, towards the end so you can get a sense for, for what you can see and explore on your own in that experience. So also as part of this interpretive process, we wanted to explore other opportunities to connect people with this area and with, the, with this history. So in addition to the video narration, as you move through the, the virtual space, um, we also were able to connect with Lori Webster, uh, a researcher who photographed a number of objects um, from this region that are now located at the Field Museum. So we were able to include these objects in the virtual tour at different points of interest on the landscape and really bring to life some of those histories and narrative that, that Shirley is presenting in the virtual experience 
through this op object based connection as well as you move through the space. So we included some examples here that highlight the different objects you can uh, take a look at uh, that are connected to the different stories that you can uh, listen to on, on the landscape as you go through the, the virtual experience. Um, so we have this beautiful plated basket, some objects um, from yucca fiber, like this, this cordage and the sandal. And then also we included some pieces from a recent survey that was done in 2019 at the site. Um, so you can take a look at different ceramic pieces that were found directly uh, here at the Mule Canyon Village as well. So what we do is combine that interpretive process or use that interpretive process to also inform the documentation of both of these locations at the Mule Canyon Village and House on Fire. And so part of our documentation process includes uh, utilizing these three different methodologies or tools as part of that process. So these include LIDAR or laser scanning, as well as photogrammetry, both terrestrial, so on the ground, or aerial photogrammetry from drones. Uh, if you're not familiar with this process or with laser scanning in particular, essentially the way that that works is the scanner emits a laser that bounces off the surrounding surfaces and is able to measure the distance when that laser comes back into the laser scanner. Um, so by moving that laser scanner around the site to different areas and through the rotation of the device and the mirror, mirror inside, we're able to collect this really like 360 view of the space and get down to millimeter accuracy in the 3D model that results from that uh, scanning data. And so we combine that LIDAR uh, data with photogrammetry, uh, both with drones and using tripods on the ground. And so what the photogrammetry does is it provides additional structural data that we can use, but it also provides that um, texture and color data that you will see in the 3D model as well. And so essentially what we do is we go around the site and document you know, every inch of of the landscape uh, through photography with about like 60% overlap uh, as we move around so that we can stitch together those photographs along with um, the, the laser scanning data to create the resulting 3D model that then is the, the canvas for these virtual tours that people can explore uh, and engage with. So these are this is an animation that's playing currently of the Mule Canyon Village. So this is the 3D data that was collected and that we processed to, to create this 3D model of the site. And so we were on location, I think for about four days to collect all, all of the LIDAR and photogrammetry data from both of these locations. And during that process, just at the Mule Canyon Village alone, we collected 1,590 aerial photos, so taking photographs from the drone, uh, just over 1,000 photographs on the ground, and then 69 LiDAR scans. So those are uh, different locations that we moved the scanner to throughout the site to collect the data that you see here in this animation. Similarly for House on Fire, we collected just over 1,000 aerial photographs from a drone, so we were able to collect quite a bit of the context surrounding the site, which I think is, is really powerful to see, you know, not only these like built structures here, but also how it connects to the surrounding landscape. And then we took just over 600 photographs with a tripod on the ground and 45 uh, laser scans. So we went to 45 different locations at House on Fire um, and did scanning at each of those locations. So with both of those two sites, you know, that's over 4,000 photographs that we took to collect all of the, that um, texture, some structural data and the color that you see here. And then just over 100 scans at different locations to get all of the, the angles um, and capture all of the little nooks and crannies that you see here that we're able to uh, put together in that resulting 3D model. 
So over the last couple of years at SciArc, we've developed this guided tour platform where we can utilize this 3D data as this canvas for exploring these sites. Um, and so these can be accessed, as I mentioned, uh, through your computer, just through the internet, or also on your phone. There are also a couple of ways that you can navigate through the experience, and I'll kind of show you how that works here in a second. Um, but one option is to explore these places through the tour. So moving from point of interest to point of interest where Shirley um, shares different historical information and about the significance of the site. Um, so at each of those locations, you can hear from her. But since this is a, a 3D model um, and this platform allows you to engage with that 3D space, you also have the freedom to move freely through, through both of these sites. So unlike a virtual tour that is utilizing 360 panoramas, uh, through this virtual experience using your keyboard, um, you can actually move through, through the space freely as well. So in addition to those different points of interest along the, the tour, uh, you can also engage with those images that I showed of the different um, objects and um, hear from Shirley at each of those locations. And then also something that's really exciting about this platform is that you can easily embed this guided tour experience in other websites. And so um, you'll be able to access this, this tour through SciArc's website, but you can also access it through the Bureau of Land Management. So if there's any other groups or if you're an educator and you want to be able to share this more freely, that is an easily accessible way to um, make this more accessible to, to broader audiences. So I am going to switch my screen here and share with you all just a, a demo of the experience so you all get a sense of what the stories that you can hear and what you can explore on your own. But I encourage you all definitely to take a look at this on your own because I, I cannot do it justice as well as, as Shirley can here. <laughs> So this is the, the virtual guided tour platform. You see uh, the 3D model that we created utilizing those methodologies and the LIDAR and photogrammetry here. Uh, in the bottom right-hand corner, you, this is where Shirley will share information um, and histories and stories at each of these points of interest. So for the Mule Canyon Village tour, which is the one that you're, you're seeing now, there's eight different stops that you can visit along the tour to learn more about different locations and different histories and stories connected uh, to the landscape. And then just above uh, Shirley's narration here, this is where you can view the supporting imagery and multimedia that support that narrative and that experience. So I'm gonna play a couple of different points of interest uh, where Shirley is speaking. Um, second. Make sure okay, sharing sound good. So that you can all get a sense for the stories that share. The important place. We always say that um, when you come to a village, you're coming to someone's home. So you want to make sure that you don't climb on the walls, you don't go down into the religious structure, the kiva, um, you don't carve your names in any of the stone. The only thing you leave are your footprints and what you can take away are pictures. This is a, a village that represents where a group of people who came into the southwest originally around about the time of Christ and then because of corn they moved from being hunters and gatherers to being a little bit more sedentary. And so here this is where the people started building and that's what you see at this particular site is uh, you see room blocks built out of stone and you need to keep in mind that when they were building this um, they didn't have the wheel they had no beasts of burden and so all of the stone that they used to build these homes were carried on their backs and often carried from long distances because if you look around the area there where did they get the stone from there aren't any rock quarries 
in the area. There's a lot of sandstone around there, but there are no real rock quarries. So they had to carve the stone and then carry it back to where they were building. The other um, thing that they had to do was to look for water. Is how did they build them, uh, make the mortar? They had to mix it with clay and mix it with sand. So where's the water? So water had to be carried from a distance, probably in baskets, yucca baskets that were lined with pitch. Um, they carried them great distance, and they probably needed a lot of water. They also could have utilized the pottery. Pottery was made from the clay that was in the area, so there was a lot of a lot of work involved. People need to realize that this isn't a so there are a number of, of different points of interest you can explore where Shirley talks more about um, ancestral Pueblo people, the people that lived here, you know, what their lives would have been like, what um, they might have been engaging with on a daily basis. And, and then she talks also about, you know, these religious structures and ceremonial aspects of what life might have been like here at the village as well. And then I wanted to share uh, one other piece that, that Shirley talks about here in the story of migration and descendant communities connection to, to the site today. Yes. The Ute people respect the lives that they had and we also marvel at the mystery of their departure. And I think that's what needs to stay is the mystery uh, of why they departed. Well, we know what the archaeologists say about drought that came in the air. That may or may not have been why they left. We know stories where the Pueblo people say that um, their creator told them it was time to leave, leave everything behind, move on, it's time for a different place. And so they, they moved south. And for many years, the archaeologists used to say they disappeared. Well, they did not disappear. Their descendants are alive and well, uh, 23 Pueblo tribes still carry the song, still carry the prayers, still come and visit the area, still talk about their people, and still carry on some of the skills, like the weaving, the pottery making. Um, that's a skill that's been handed down from generation to generation, and you can still see it among the people today, among their descendants. This is... So I encourage everyone to check out these other points of interest at Mill Canyon, um, but hopefully that gives you uh, a preview of, of the types of stories you can engage with and the histories presented here. I also wanted to share the example here as well of the House on Fire site. And I'll, I'll share a couple of points of interest here with Shirley talking about the site. So it wasn't just I think the important thing about this uh, house on fire is the architecture. If you take a close look at how it was built, the craftsmanship really shows. Uh, and there's different styles of architecture at this particular site, or particular granary. It's a storage area. There's five of them. I don't know if you can pick out the five, but there's actually five. And the... Um, just the way that they built is absolutely phenomenal. And if you keep in mind the fact that they had to carry this stone up onto that alcove, which is on an alc on a, an incline, carry it on their back, lots of rocks, and then they had to carry water up that incline on their, you know, probably in like I described before in the pitch line baskets um, attached to yucca twine that's how they would have carried it on their back with the yucca twine as rope and then they mix the mortar they had to find clay to mix in with the dirt and there's not a whole lot of dirt on there because it's slick rock so they had to carry that down so when you think about all the time that it took to build these storage areas and you know it was important to them so what are they doing there they're storing so I just wanted to show a quick example of how you can move through this space in addition to going to these different points of interest on the site. Um, you can use your keyboard. Um, so I think it's really powerful in particular with this site with what Shirley's talking about is just these architectural features and the care that went into um, constructing these storage uh, facilities and areas is, is just really amazing. Um, 
And so for, for folks who have maybe a higher internet speed, you have the option down here to view this in either a high definition or standard definition um, to increase that resolution and quality of, of the 3D model as well. So I wanted to highlight just one more point of interest here that, that Shirley talks about, uh, about providing you know, not only the history of the specific place, but another important part of this story is how these different sites connect to these broader, broader communities, both historically and today. So it wasn't just the people up in that one village that utilized this storage area. All, most of the folks would uh, come and share, help build and come and share. So they, it was not an isolated group of people living in one village and no one else around. There are many sites up there and they all knew each other. And they were probably related to each other through marriage, through clans, and so they would come and celebrate together. So it's not like they were isolated and they were all alone. This is a large community of people in this area that helped each other out, survived, prayed together, um, survived together, struggled together. This is a whole, it's, a, it's a beautiful story of um, human survival. So hopefully that gives you all a, a sense of what you can see and explore on the virtual guided tour experience. Um, and like I mentioned, you can access that both on SIRC's website and BLM's website. We'll include a link here uh, in the chat as well. One second, pulling up our presentation here. And I just wanted to pass it back to you, Jared, to talk a little bit about future collaborations and um, ongoing projects at PLM. Yeah, so in the future with SciArc, we'll be working um, along Butler Wash. And actually, even this week, we have SciArc working of course, Whitney's not out there with them, but um, one of their field crews is out documenting the Butler Wash develop site, which you guys can see down here on the left side. Um, and this site is, again, it's another site off of Highway 95 that was partially restored um, and wasn't part of the offsite mitigation for Highway 95 um, in the 1970s and is in need of some updated interpretation. And we're hoping that SciArt can help with that. So they're going to be working at that site and two other sites along Butler Wash, which we have not fully selected. Um, and they're going to do documentation of that. And the other part of this project is to work with descendant communities to provide the interpretive material for these sites um, instead of with our staff. Part of the reason we had to use our staff for the last one was we were kind of doing the work during the height of COVID. Um, so we kind of had to use our own staff to, to build those stories and construct those stories with SciArc. So um, for this next one, though, we will be working with um, the sovereign nations to work on on the interpretation for these projects and helping us with these. Um, we're also partnered with Crow Canyon Archaeological Center to do another similar type of project, but different um, at Moon House and potentially other two other sites, I believe. Um, <clears throat> and you can see Moon House pictured on the right here. I'm sure most folks are familiar with Moon House. It's one of the best preserved sites on um, in Bears Ears National Monument. Um, uh, in Fishnow Canyons and McLeod Canyon specifically. Um, and it's a really neat site um, with an allocated permit system. And it's also very difficult to get to. So um, they're actually going to create in-person 3D guided tours with um, Oculus head headsets with headsets so they can actually, visitors can come and experience those maybe at places like Crow Canyon or at our local visitor centers here, like the Bears Ears Education Center or Edge of Cedars or at the Blanding Visitor Center. Um, so that's another kind of 3D project tour that we're working on. And that one is also working with um, descending communities to build those stories about Moon House and those two other sites. So two other projects that we'll have coming down. Um, it's gonna be a few years out for those ones before we'll have them finished, but. Those are two other meat sites that were two other projects that we're working on. And I think that's all we have for the presentation. I think we wanted to leave some time for any questions that we might have. Happy to answer any questions about the project or where you want to access them. 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you so much. What a spectacular presentation and the um, boy, the technology has really gotten amazing in terms of being able to, to see and, and visualize uh those those sites i'm i've i've seen seen digital models before but those are those are really spectacular i'm gonna just take a look at the um uh questions in the chats it, it does look like everybody is interested in in uh getting the links so i think um uh whitney's putting those in the chat fantastic i know after this i'm going to going to go uh and and play with them a little bit myself really really incredible um, I'm going to go ahead and we, we have a lot of questions coming in, so I will put my own questions on hold and, and jump into the audience. Uh, we had a question around um, which I was typing an answer to and then decided uh, uh, it'd be better for Jared to go ahead and answer this around the timeline uh, for the establishment of, of the monument. Um, it, it was um, President Obama correct to establish the monument and uh, we had a question, um, uh, someone trying to understand um, uh, what happened between uh, when the monument was established and uh, the BLM establishing their presence at the monument and having it open to the public, but it, it was already open to the public. Is, is that correct? It just changed status? Maybe if you could elaborate right. on yeah. that a little bit. So, um, Bears Ears National Monument, um, you know, before it was designated in 2016 by President Obama, um, was public lands before, um, managed both by the Forest Service and the Bureau of Land Management. Um, and most of these places were open to the public before. Um, so the monument provides a different status for these places and particularly withdraws it from mineral entry um, in the future, but also requires the BLM and the Forest Service, which we're working on currently to create new management plans, um, which we're working on those now, which will make sure that we're um, providing for protection and restorations of the monument objects and values that are described in the proclamations. Perfect, thank you so much. I, I was fortunate enough to spend some time backpacking out in that area before it was uh, before it was monument land and just spectacular and deserving of all the protections. Um, we have uh, some uh, lots of questions about um, indigenous uh, descendants and and um, perhaps for for the layperson, someone had asked if you could define what you mean by descendant communities. Yeah, so descendant communities. By that, we generally just mean those folks who descended from folks who lived here in the past, and we consider those folks who lived here their ancestors. Um, you know when. When Crow Canyon does their land acknowledgments at the beginning, that's kind of what they're referencing to is um, those folks who still live here who are attached to the folks who lived in these places in the past. So um, that's who we're working with on these future projects are these descendant communities. And they're all mostly parts of sovereign nations today that include the Ute Mountain Ute and the Hopi Pueblo and the Zuni Pueblo and um, the Northern Ute as well as the Navajo Nation, so. Thank you very much. Um, uh, we have sort of a follow-up question around uh, your work with Indigenous and descendant communities from one of our former educators, Jojo Matson. Hi, Jojo. <laughs> so glad to see your name pop up. Um, uh, and Jojo wanted to know uh, how, what are your future plans around collaboration with Indigenous communities? Um, have you been working on a consultant basis or more of participants in your research? Um, could you chat, chat with us a bit about that? Yeah, um, I'm sure some of you know, Bears Ears National Monument is very focused on working with um, our sovereign nations, particularly the five tribes, which I just mentioned. Um, and we are going to be working with them. We actually just signed a cooperative agreement with the five tribes um, this last weekend, um, which kind of um, outlines how we're going to work with them um, managing Bears Ears National Monument. And um, as far as specific things we're working on, we're really trying to build that collaborative network working with um, the five tribes and other tribes. So uh, like I mentioned, we're working with SciArc on projects specifically working with descendant communities and sovereign nations, as well as Crow Canyon Archaeological Center. But we also have projects with Living Heritage Research Council, which is based in um, Cortez, um, where Crow Canyon is. And they are also assisting us with um, working with tribal communities and doing ethnographic work here on the Monticello Field Office and Bears Ears National Monument. And we're also working on another project that will soon be starting soon with Friends of Cedar Mesa to also invite tri tribal engagement on Bears Ears National Monument. 
So that's fantastic. beyond our normal uh, consultation on different projects. Of course. No, that's that's wonderful. Um, and uh, as, as a member of the public, someone someone had asked, um, uh, are there indigenous people or descendants that are that are out there on a daily basis uh, at Bears Ears to for the public to interact with and, and to help interpret these uh, sites for the public? Um, not necessarily, I guess. I'm sure most tribal folks who are out there are usually doing different things that are important to them, um, different ceremonial practices, or maybe just visiting the area for their interest too and haven't been here for a while. Um, we are, you know, that's one of the things we've definitely thought about um, going forward with Bears Ears National Monument is having potentially Native youth and other um, of our sovereign nations working with us to help educate the public on the ground while they're out here. Um, we haven't gotten there yet, but that's something we're definitely considering and trying to work with, with Friends of Cedar Mesa and other organizations for sure, as well as the Bears Ears Commission, hopefully in the future, so. Fantastic. Um, so a couple of specific questions. Uh, why is that site you showcased called House on Fire? <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, the way these places get their names is always interesting. Mule Canyon is, its name comes from, it's near a canyon called Mule. Um, House on Fire is actually in Mule Canyon proper. Um, and the name comes from just the coloring that it gets at certain times of the year. And it's actually become very popular on social media. Um, and that's where it gets its name is the, basically the roof of the alcove kind of lights up almost like it's on fire. So that's where it comes from is House on Fire why that's named that site we didn't name that site that's just kind of the name that it's taken on over the years so. pretty pretty spectacular there's some amazing photography around house on fire that makes you uh, uh, makes it clear why uh, why it got named or why it, it get, got that name um so a couple of questions about the, your future work uh one of our attendees says so many great sites in bears ears what is the process for determining the priority for, for this kind of online interpretation? Uh, while the accessible ones are great, the less accessible ones are sometimes less impacted by prior interpretation. Yeah, that's a really good question. And it's definitely a consideration we take pretty seriously with these sites. And it's a balancing act because, you know, and Whitney might want to speak to this too, is, you know, we don't want to necessarily um, increase visitation to particular sites by highlighting them through these um, online tours as well. So that's definitely a consideration we're taking into when we're thinking about sites that we're going to pick for this. Um, Moon House is probably one of the, you know, it's not the least accessible site out here, but it's definitely difficult to access. And part of the reason we decided to do um, select that site is it has an allocated permit system. Only 36 people a day can visit that site. Um, and so that one's pretty protected in that sense. Um, right. But, you know, those are the kinds of considerations we take is we don't want to necessarily create a huge rush to one of our sites that's not really prepared for it. Um, so that's one of the major considerations for us. Um, other than that, it's, you know, working with the tribes to talk about which ones might be worthwhile um, in the future, particularly the ones we're going to be working on with SciArc um, in the future. So, yeah. Yeah, excellent. And that's, um, uh, I don't know if you know if there, uh, the answer to this, but someone asked uh, how many archaeological sites are in uh, the Bears Ears and uh, a couple of folks asking, you know, are you going to document all of them this way? Or are you planning <laughs> to capture the entire monument? <laughs> that would be pretty amazing to be able to do that. No, we probably don't plan on doing this for every single site we have. Um, you know, one way we kind of track the amount of sites recorded in a county for um, for the state of Utah, actually, not just on Bureau of Land Management lands, are we assign site numbers. They're called Smithsonian trinom trinomials. And the last part of that number actually is a count of how many sites are in the county. Um, and Bears Ears National Monument is only within San Juan County, Utah. And there's some around 37,000 sites recorded in San Juan County, Utah, which Bears Ears is fully within and there's some outside of some of San Juan County outside of Bears Ears as well. Um, it's really hard to estimate how many sites there could be, but some folks do estimate over hundreds of thousands of sites in the region. That's only those 37,000 sites are with only five to 10% of the area surveyed. So 
You can yeah. imagine, <laughs> but there are very many more. <laughs> yes, our, uh, our our researchers at Crow Canyon would, would certainly agree with you, the, the site density in this area and, and a little farther south here in our area is uh, in Montezuma County. It's just off, off the charts, really incredible, huge occupation in this area. <laughs> Um, let's see. Uh, so people are kind of interested in how much um, how much visitation these two initial tours uh, have seen. Are people spending a lot of time on on the site? I'll let Whitney handle that one. She's been kind of looking up those numbers for us recently. Yeah, I think what was the the number? It was about nine thousand uh, virtual visitors to the website and. Um, a number of people engaging directly with with these virtual tours um, and what we're really excited to see is people spending time you know as well to listen to these stories and kind of connect with with that space and so um, yeah we're really pleased so far with the the virtual visitation I think the more we get to be part of opportunities like this and the more people learn about this this resource um, hopefully the more people will be able to utilize it for either just their own interest in, in the topic in these places or in educational spaces like in the classroom and a lot of our virtual tours we see people coming from places like Google Classroom or, or other things like that so we know that they're getting used in, in educational settings as well so that's something we're really excited about. Yeah, well, it's wonderful to have this open to the public. We, we will no doubt be uh, using it in, in some of our uh, teaching as well. Um, kind of a, as a twist on, on that, uh, one of our, our viewers was kind of wondering, um, are you gonna sort of push advertising these in some of the, the, the surrounding metropolitan areas like Las Vegas, LA, Salt Lake? And, and his question is, would this help uh, uh, decrease the on-site visitation that might lower the impact to the sites. Is that kind of one of your goals? Um, Whitney, do you want to go ahead with that one? Or? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's hard to say, you know, I think it depends on the individual in terms of somebody might see this virtual experience and be like, oh, this is amazing. You know, now I, I want to go and visit this place. Another person might see this virtual experience and be like, this is amazing. I can cross this off my list now since I've you know, been able to virtually engage with this space. And so like Jared mentioned, I think it is a delicate balance on choosing which sites that we want to focus on and make sure that there's resources allocated that can support visitation to these places. Um, but I think generally a main goal with this project is to promote respectful engagement with this cultural heritage, both virtually and both in person. So if people do choose um, you know, see this virtual experience and then want to go visit the site now that they have learned about how you can respectfully engage with this heritage and why this place is so meaningful for communities today, I think um, can be really powerful in terms of, of facilitating that engagement. Yeah, and as far as advertising, I mean, really so far, usually we've used our other partners such as Friends of Cedar Mesa and the State Historic Preservation Office here in Utah and events like this to kind of talk about um, these projects. Um, we've also done a little presentation for um, groups here in Utah who are visiting um, a BLM, what we call a customer service week. Um, so we did a presentation for that too. And that's mostly how we're getting the word out for, for this. Okay. Fantastic. And just uh, get, getting some more questions about the, the, the link and it is in the chat, everybody, if you kind of scroll back through the chat. <laughs> Um, you can find the link there and uh, okay let's see um, we have someone kind of interested in uh, what you mentioned about the all right now I gotta find it let's see <laughs> one of our board members uh, actually was curious about why the artifacts were uh, at or at the field museum I'm actually looking for her questions did you know that the answer to that Jared Oh, it's a complicated story. I would say <laughs> kind of too bad Lori is not here to explain it for us, but um, those that's part of a project um, that Lori Webster is working on. Um, it's called the Cedar Mesa Perishables Project. Um, and it's a very neat project, but um, the long and short of how those artifacts ended up at the Field Museum is they were actually removed from the Cedar Mesa region, um, Bears Ears National Monument. 
um, actually before the 1900s and were um, taken to museums in the East, including museums like the Field Museum um, and stuff like that. So um, Lori is doing an amazing project to redocument all that stuff and kind of give it as best of an idea of where it came from as we can get. Um, and it's a really neat project and I encourage you to look her stuff up too. And um, she was kind enough to provide us photos for that, so. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, that's great. We we love Lori Webster uh, around here. Um, so, just I think I think I'm mostly getting through so the audience questions. I was um, uh, uh, interested in the kind of feedback you may have gotten from the folks uh, who are who are viewing it. Uh, I'm I'm interested. Maybe uh, those of you who are watching. Uh, if you want to put any thoughts in the chat, I'm just kind of curious as to are are from people who have been to Bears Ears and then gone to look at, at these tours or people who haven't been to Bears Ears and don't think they would be able to go kind of what what you might be uh, what input you might be getting about about the experience. Do they feel like it's um, really giving them the flavor and texture of the uh, of uh, as if you were actually there. Yeah, I don't know if Whitney wants to answer this too. I, you know, we haven't heard a ton of feedback, I guess I would say, from folks that have visited. I've, I've heard, you know, little anecdotal things here and there just from folks saying this is really neat and thanks for putting it together. Um, but I don't know, I haven't heard anything too in depth or reviews like to, towards that effect, but um, I don't know, Whitney, have you heard anything else? Yeah, I think people are really excited about it. You know, this is when I'm talking with other groups about other projects we're working on, I always share this one as an example and people get um, very excited about the opportunity to engage with the landscape. But even just in our, our conversations for this ongoing collaboration with descendant communities and talking about the value that they see in it is, um, you know, some people from these communities have, even though they know about these places, maybe also don't have these opportunities to visit them. and. Um, you know, visiting them in person is never going to be the same as is the virtual experience, but providing um, this access and then being able to amplify these voices and stories that you might not be able to get when you're there in person, um, I think is, a, is an opportunity that people have, have expressed to me that they, they see value in as well. But yeah, always curious to, to hear people's feedback. I would love to, to hear, hear more about um, what people see value in or, you know, opportunities that we could consider exploring as well. Excellent. Thank you. And we are getting some, some feedback uh, in the chat here. Uh, people are feeling like it, it makes it more accessible. I mean, there's obviously, um, even if you're able to visit these sites, they, they're challenging to get to, to get the same uh, kind of experience. And honestly, there are even if you did visit in person, obviously the way that you can you can dig into the sites and move around in them is 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 uh, in some ways you're seeing more things uh, on the virtual tour than than it seems like um, you you could necessarily see in person. Um, so yeah, it looks like the feedback from from the chat is uh, is is pretty pretty positive. Um, uh, we have a, a couple other a couple other questions that that I think would be interesting to answer um, from one we as you talked about with your tribal stakeholders and descendant stakeholders um, in these sites. Obviously, there are many different uh, people and communities that are um, uh, that that claim ancestry that uh, also um, feel that these are really important sites and landscapes to their culture. Someone uh, asked about the thought process behind having the interpretation done uh, by a by a Diné or Ute uh, interpreter um, uh, to with ancestral Puebloan sites and and was this a conversation uh, or or deliberation that happened uh, with within um, the organization as to um, you know the the particular uh, tribal interpreters yeah we talked about that and as i mentioned before that is definitely part of the next when we work when we're working with cyric on these future projects along butler wash including the butler develop site um we really do hope to bring in 
um, interpreters from um, the nations themselves and bring in those descendant community true connections to these places. Um, Shirley Cloud Lane is Navajo and Ute actually, so she has a little bit of that perspective too. Um, but yeah, we really hope to bring in those connections when we're moving forward with these other ones, as well as our work with Crow Canyon in the future too. Um, with Moonhouse, the hope is to have a lot of input from um, descending communities as well on that project and, and get descending community voices in to help us better understand these places better than, better than we can do from the BLM's perspective, for sure. Yeah, well, I mean, just the, the uh, we, we are big proponents of, of multivocal uh, interpretations of all of, all of these um, sites and are really excited to be working, working with y'all on, on the Moonhouse project. We talk about that around here uh, quite a bit. Um, uh, kind of around a, a, a public access uh, question, someone wondered if that imagery is, is shared or available to uh, researchers um, beyond just being able to look at the, um, at the tours on the site. Um, yeah, actually, um, and Whitney, you can answer questions too on this one. Um, it's generally available. Um, you know, BLM kind of owns a lot of that data with SciArc. Um, and so we do have that data. And if folks are interested in it, we could give it to them. A lot of it is um, pretty complex data. And Whitney can probably <laughs> attest to that a little bit better than I can. And so some of it may not be easily accessible, depending on um, what kind of software you have, for example. Um, but a lot of that data is accessible and we are planning on um, sharing that data as much as we can. I've talked to our state historic preservation officer to kind of hold that data long term um, as a part of this as well. Um, so that's another thing we intend on doing. So that kind of information could be accessed through them as well. Yeah. And in SIARC, we're part of a consortium um, called Open Heritage 3D, where a number of institutions have donated or contributed 3D data of cultural heritage sites. So this data will eventually be accessible for researchers and for educational use through that platform. Um, but uh, as, as Jared mentioned, it is, it's the raw data, you know, all of those photographs that we collected and all of those scans. And um, so it does require a little bit of knowledge on, on how to navigate that, that type of data, but that will be accessible and in addition to the virtual tours on our website, you can access the 3D models directly through this 3D model platform called Sketchfab. Um, so there are other ways to, to engage with, with that data as well um, that yeah, we're trying to make it as accessible as possible for, for folks. Fantastic, that's just wonderful. Um, very open access oriented around, around here too. Couple of questions about SciArc that I uh, that I'm just going to combine. Um, uh, one of our uh, viewers uh, kind of took a look at the link that you shared on SciArc and wanted to know how you fund the worldwide documentations and virtual visitations that, that you have on the website, and also if you are approved as a vendor for the national parks and, and organizations like the Nature Conservancy. <laughs> yeah, that, that's a great question. And so we're a nonprofit organization that that doesn't have an endowment. So we don't have any sort of like base funding for the work that we do. So a lot of it comes in either through grants um, or through existing like relationships or partnerships. A lot of times we just get, you know, emails from folks who've heard about our work and are interested in documenting a site they manage and they might have a funding opportunity to, to support that work. Um, so sometimes it's us doing you know, somebody reaches out and we, we want to document the site and we need to find a funding source. And so we apply uh, for a grant together as an example. And sometimes um, sites or folks reach, reach out to us with, with that funding source. Um, but um, it really just depends on the project, a lot of different ways that we fund our projects. Um, and what, there was another question in your question that I'm forgetting. Oh, they wanted to kind of know, do you get approved as vendors for oh, different yes, yes. organizations? Oh, yeah. um, yes, We are a part of the CESU system. Um, so we do partner with, with national parks um, and can easily do that through, through that work. So um, yes, please, if, if you're interested in, in collaborating, we'd love to hear from you. Um, 
kind of an interesting question. Uh, someone asked about sort of advertising and are you considering uh, monetizing the virtual visits? <laughs> From, from Sire's perspective, this is all freely accessible um, and we that's not something that, that we do. You know, our funding sources come through those grants and other ways that I mentioned. But. Yeah, and this is all done through an assistance agreement with the Bureau of Land Management, which is similar to a grant. Um, and so this work was all funded via that um, with help from Sire, of course, and their help um, on that project. So um, no, it will remain to be free on Sire's website for the foreseeable future. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, I was hoping that that was the answer. So um, um, excellent. Um, so we're right at five o'clock. I'm going to I'm going to end with this one or we're almost right at five o'clock. I was going to end with I think you've captured people's uh, interest, Jared, and someone wanted to know if there are any volunteer opportunities uh, there. <laughs> Um, yeah, we always have volunteer opportunities. Um, you know, I would direct you, um, Friends of Cedar Mesa does help us a ton, um, kind of coordinating volunteers and stuff like that. So I would definitely encourage you to look at Friends of Cedar Mesa's website. Um, but if you want to reach out to me, um, I'll put my email in the chat here, just my BLM email. Um, you can feel free to reach out to me. Um, we also work with, um, the Utah State Historic Preservation Office for our site stewardship program. Um, so we have a really great site stewardship program. So if you get on um, the Utah State Historic Preservation Office's website, you can get information about that as well. Um, and that's a great way to help us out. Um, Friends of Cedar Mesa runs a pretty small volunteer program, which we're hoping to in increase over the next many years, which is a site ambassador program. Um, so that's another program that um, you know, basically goes out and educates visitors about how to access these sites and how to visit with respect. So um, those are kind of the main ways I would definitely suggest looking into um, volunteering for, for us. Fantastic. Well, thank you both for your time for the incredible presentation. I know everybody will be jumping off and visiting the site. So your numbers are, are gonna go through the roof right after this. And uh, we're so looking forward to doing something similar with the Moon House Project. And I'm sure there will be a webinar uh, forthcoming uh, as, as that gets underway. So <laughs> thank you everyone for joining us to watch uh, on Zoom and on Facebook. And thank you so much, Jared and Whitney. Um, wonderful work, congratulations on your projects. Thank you guys. Thank you so All much. right. Okay. Bye-bye, everyone.